And let me introduce uh, Amy Perot. Amy is of mixed, Mar mixed Métis heritage from Thompson, Manitoba. She is thankful to be a guest on Musqueam Territory, where she is a coordinator of Aboriginal initiatives at UBC's Centre for Teaching, Learning and Technology. She works with faculty, TAs and administrators to support the development of a higher standard of professionalism in conducting discussions of indigeneity and other contentious is social issues in the classroom. Uh, Amy is a co-developer of of, and researcher for what I learned in class today, which many of you may know um, and have probably used in your classes. And manages, she also manages the development of the web resource called Indigenous Foundations. So please join me in welcoming Amy. In order to understand the culture of classroom climate here at UBC, I'd like to begin by discussing a research project, um, as Hartej mentioned, um, that in many ways opened up the discourse about this on campus. This project was born out of a need to address the problematic um, ways Indigenous histories, cultures, and perspectives were being discussed in classrooms at the University of British Columbia. As students in the First Nation Studies program, we were required to take a, a core set of courses in addition to courses in other disciplines that had Indigenous content. I think uh, Dr. Archibald talked about this as well with NITEP students, a similar um, situation. Um, so, sorry. Um, it was in the courses outside of the program we, where we experienced firsthand comments our classmates would make that would leave us feeling angry and upset. We were also quite shocked at our instructors' reactions and inability to navigate the classroom space in a productive way after these situations occurred. We often left the classroom feeling unsupported and alone. Uh, well, when looking at a literature piece that was written by an Aboriginal um, author, uh, there was a student that said, just write out, put put her hand up and she said, why are Aboriginal people so screwed up? I was like speechless and totally disappointed and uh, really hurt, really hurt. Like, yeah, just the, ugh, like disgusted <laughs> that somebody would even say it like that, that somebody would even, like, part of me is resentful that she's even ballsy enough to put her hand up and say something like that, whether it's about Aboriginal people or whoever, it doesn't matter. You don't talk like that in university, <laughs> like, this is, uh, I don't know, but it kind of came from that idea of, like, assumption that Aboriginal people aren't here, that they're not, she, she, would, she wouldn't take the care. Like if, if it was a one-on-one -on -one conversation, she wouldn't have said that to my face if she knew that I was Aboriginal. So it really, her anonymity was really easy to draw on so that she could feel, um, that she felt safe enough to say that, you know. And maybe it's a little bit of uh, faith on her part to think that nobody's going to counter her on the uh, the violence of those words. You know, she felt safe enough thinking, well, nobody's going to nobody's going to assault me on the way I just asked that question. And I guess she was right because nobody said anything. So the interviews we conducted with our classmates, Dara Kelly included, and Francine Verning also was part of the project, um, and others, and instructors, outlined areas where the university needed to improve. The project provided a space for conversations around classroom experiences to surface, and it created a call to action to instructors to step up and take responsibility for what was happening in their own classrooms. In our research, we observed that faculty who set up a framework for engagement early in the term were able to have discussions around race, identity, and Indigenous topics more fluidly. Faculty we work with also note that they preface their course material as being potentially difficult and of a sensitive nature and initiate this conversation within the first week as a way to prepare students and acknowledge that there may be discomfort in the course. 
However, this discomfort is part of the learning process that they will undergo in the class. So although we had a lot of support from the university administration, we were still dealing with pushback on the ground level. We acknowledged that we were working with deep-seated beliefs and attitudes, as well as people who were a product of a flawed educational system that did not include the voices and perspectives of Indigenous people. So here are some reactions that we had um, to our project when we first started doing it. So I don't know if enough about Aboriginal people to answer the questions that might come up. I'm not Aboriginal, so I'd have trouble speaking for Aboriginal people. And I do not have Aboriginal people or deal with Aboriginal issues in my class workplace, so this material is not really relevant. I hear that one still a lot. The ongoing work around classroom climate that was initiated through our project has been recognized at an institutional level and has been documented in the Aboriginal Strategic Plan, the Equity and Diversity Strategic Plan, and Place and Promise UBC Strategic Plan as a priority area for the university, as Alden mentioned. What I Learned in Class Today provided a snapshot into the classroom environment and provided a space for students to archive their experiences. Prior to this, video recorded first-hand accounts from students discussing their classroom experiences had not been widely used at UBC. This project was designed to incite dialogue around the, around the ways the university engages in conversations around Aboriginal histories, cultures, and experiences within a pedagogical setting. As a, as a result of this engagement, people were starting to question their own approaches and reflect on ways that they could create a more support supportive space for these exchanges on campus. Thank you, Amy. And some of Amy's colleagues will continue um, some of this, uh, continue and extend this presentation as well. So let me introduce. Um, Anai Sukado. Um, Anai Sukado works as a professional development coordinator at CTLT uh, in collaboration with colleagues at CTLT, the First Nations House of Learning, and the Wewa Library. She has been developing a teaching and learning resource called Education for Aboriginal Students at UBC Historical Timeline. She is also a PhD candidate in educational studies. And as an international student from Japan, her work focuses on the construction of international students' identities in the internationalization of Japanese university education. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Hatish, for the introduction. And then um, I would like to appreciate uh, the Muskegon people for their generosity, and uh, I'd like to also thank the organizers for this opportunity. So uh, this, uh, in just five minutes, I'd like to talk about the project I've been working on since last summer in collaboration with many people that had been just mentioned in the introduction. So that um, the project that I've been working on is called Education for Aboriginal Students at UBC, Historical Timeline, but I just call it Timeline Project, just to make it short. So um, this Timeline Project was born out of the desire to have to gain a locally specific um, contextual understanding of the issues concerning Aboriginal students at UBC today. And then um, here is a screenshot of the timeline that, that is still under construction. We have just be, um, begun plugging in the historical events that I have researched in the past year. And then, so this is how it looks like, but it's just a part of it. Um, so as you see though, uh, I don't know if you can see really <laughs> clearly on this screen. Uh, let me show the another screen, uh, just a second. It may be bigger. So uh, meh, maybe not better. <laughs> But uh, just um, as you see in the bottom rows, uh, we, uh, I created three lines of historical events. Uh, one is called Canada, and also that line includes historical events in Canada and BC, for example, the end of World War II, uh, you probably you won't see from the distance. But also, uh, I created a line called UBC, so that's a history documenting major historical events institutional historical events at UBC, like when they st UBC was established and some major events. And also another line that is in the middle row, it's uh, UBC Aboriginal engagement. So that's the, the line where uh, I documented historical events involving Aboriginal students at UBC. 
So um, just the idea of it is that just so that we have contextualized understanding of how the UBC's relationship with Aboriginal students have come to the place where we are and who we are today, how we relate to the history as individuals. Um, so currently we are in the process of still developing the uh, online format and also we are hoping to develop a user guide so that uh, instructors in different disciplines get some ideas about how they may be able to use this material in their teaching settings. So um, let me just briefly talk about the process of creating the timeline and some of my personal reflections on what it means to someone like me to think about my relationship to this place. And um, so I am an international student from Japan and I came to Vancouver in 2007 uh, to begin my PhD study in educational studies. And so when I came here, I came from very much a place of ignorance. It's really embarrassing, but I didn't even really look into the history of the place that, that I'm coming to live and spend some significant time of my life. Um, so I just came without knowing anything, um, but I, this inspiration for this timeline project came last March when I attended an on-campus uh, event on um, Japanese Canadian students' internment experience. So that's where Larry, uh, the elder Larry Grant talked about historical differences and parallels between Japanese Canadians and um, Aboriginal students here. And I started to wonder, so okay, if this happened to Japanese Canadians, what was the his history like for Aboriginal students at UBC? That, so that's how this project began. So to create a timeline, um, as well as looking at the history of um, the relationships that Canada and the UBC have had with Aboriginal peoples. I looked at the history of Asian Canadians, such as the internment camp for Japanese Canadians, and also head tax for Chinese Canadians, and so on, just as a, my point of reference. And then these events really helped me see myself in the history of this place. And it made me wonder how my experience in Canada might have been different if the colonial regime had not established white supremacy in Canada. And just a second. <laughs> and in this way, I came to understand that my daily experience, experience here today have historical underpinnings. Also, I have come to realize that I am not outside of Canadian history, but very much part of it. For example, um, I am a woman of color on the one hand, whether I like it or not. <laughs> and on the other hand, I benefit enormously from educational opportunities at UBC standing on this unceded territory of masculine people. And I know that my English as well as my degree from this Western academic institution will put me in a position of privilege in Japan or anywhere I go. <clears throat> so as a way of it kind of, as a way to reciprocate my learning here, I'd like to utilize the process and the product of the timeline project, like today, to engage various UBC community members in a conversation about our relationship to this place and what our role may be. I feel that when we develop a shared understanding of the time and the place that we share, um, we may be able to develop a collective sense of some responsibility that generates our future action. So thank you very much for listening. I'll invite Sarah. Sarah Ling is um, also works at CTLT. And Sarah is, uh, I'll just introduce you and if you're all set up right, yeah. Sarah Ling is a first generation Chinese Canadian from Prince Rupert, BC on Simsiam territory as a graduate academic assistant for CTLT Aboriginal Initiatives. She develops multimedia resources that value place regarding UBC's location on Musqueam territory. She is a master's student in the Interdisciplinary Studies graduate program and works with Musqueam to revitalize its history of Chinese market gardening. Sarah co-developed an initiative called Decolonizing Knowledge, which responds to issues of misrepresentation at Totem Park residents by advancing information about its house names and intercultural history through community collaboration. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. In Musqueam's language, Hunkaminam 
Um, it, it gives me good feelings to be here today on Musqueam territory, and I would like to thank my instructors from the First Nations Language Program for allowing me to participate in revitalizing their language on the land where it belongs. As Hartej mentioned, in my undergraduate degree, I co-founded a project called Decolonizing Knowledge, and this was with a uh, student, Spencer Lindsay. We were both uh, a part of the First Nations Studies program here. And we wanted to create an initiative that advanced what we were learning in First Nations Studies classes beyond the classroom. We wanted to mobilize the skills and knowledge we were being equipped with. And so we looked at Totem Park Residence, which was a place that we had a common connection to in that Spencer had lived there and I had spent a few summers working there. We realized that there were many issues of misrepresentation and appropriation. We saw a knowledge gap, not only for students, but for staff. For example, some students living in Diné House, and Spencer just uh, created a documentary about this. They went out on the day of the longboat race on, on campus and dressed up as the Diné Savages, and that was their name. They dressed up as they thought would be appropriate, and were not confronted uh, throughout the entire process. And so for Spencer and I, our, our response to witnessing these issues has been to advance local indigenous knowledge as well as Musqueam presence at Totem Park residents. We realize that this lack of knowledge and understanding amongst students and staff has led to acts of disrespect and misrepresentation. And, and not only um, just creating resources, but involving communities as we do so. And so at CTLT, um, it's been two years since we co-founded that initiative. My role as an academic assistant for Aboriginal initiatives has allowed me to continue the process of making sustainable resources that students can have access to, not only at Totem Park residents, but in their classrooms. And I had the pleasure of working with some faculty here who were interested in using place-based materials in their courses. So I thought I'd take the next few minutes to showcase some of the work that I'm helping to do at CTLT. Much of the resources are, are video based, so one project I am involved in is working with Amy Perel, Elder Larry Grant, and Jerry Lawson from the Rural History Lab at the Museum of Anthropology to um, review a series of interviews that Amy and another lady, Erin Hansen, had conducted with their elder Larry Grant about his life experiences. And we hope to edit these multiple interviews and host them permanently on Indigenous Foundation's website um, through the interactive video transcript viewer that Link Kessler has created. Another project I am leading is to create short educational clips about each of the house names at Total Park Residence. We have just finished filming the two videos about Hamlesum and Kalahan, the two Musqueam place names. And I'm happy to announce that we recently received an equity enhancement fund to create films for the other six houses there. I'm also working on creating an educational resource guide. This is something that I worked on for the past couple years, but also through a course called Musqueam 101 with Jennifer Kramer and Sue Rowley. And here's a snapshot of a couple of the pages. Um, <coughs> the beginning of the guide welcomes students, staff, and faculty to the territory that we're on of the Musqueam people. Um, the snapshot above, you can see uh, an introduction to the Mekinian language. And on the bottom is an example of how I introduce each of the house names. And I thought the best way to talk about each house name is to focus on a relationship UBC has had with that nation. For example, for the Nuchalman people, which is currently represented as Nook House, there is a Wheeler's Pole outside of the county building. And also, you can see that little Lego man, um, that's Captain Cook. And, and it's a great story of how Captain Cook wrongly named the Nuchalman people Nook House because he was on a book, he was on a boat he canoe heading towards the Nuchalman peoples, and they, they were calling Nook Nook go around. But, she thought that was their name. <laughs> and, and recently I've been um, trying to collect stories from students to see what impact these resources can have on our campus. And after doing a walking tour with students in the Coordinated Arts Program um, with Dr. Catherine Grafton, 
we disseminated a survey and I thought I'd share a few of the stories that students uh, wrote down. One student uh, used to live at Toronto Park and, and now feels a deeper appreciation for that space. Another student learned about the Alahan fortification site and, and how the lead warrior Kaya Palazzo defended his people. And so looking at UBC not just as a place of buildings and, and classes, but seeing it as a place that the Mastering people have occupied for thousands of years and um, used in multiple ways, such as defending their laws and customs. And several of the students had no idea that there was the Longhouse Building, the Kuihua Library, or the healing lodges that are just behind them, which are not originally from Musqueam, but were set up with their permission. And so to conclude, I think this poster from Musqueam echoes a lot of what the panelists today have shared, and it says, don't forget who you are, don't forget who we are. Hi, Tsepka, and I look forward to the rest of the symposium.